right of the hand. The right of the hand is that you stretch it not towards that which is unlawful to you. The right of the legs. The right of the legs is that you walk not with them towards that which is unlawful to you. You have no escape from standing upon the narrow bridge. So you should see to it that your legs do not slip and cause you to fall into the fire. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to Live in London. Previously we've been discussing the Treaty of Rights, Rasulat al-Hukuk by Imam al-Sajjad. We discussed the rights of the tongue, the rights of the eyes, the rights of the self, the rights of God. And we would like to thank you for your interaction with us and encourage you to continue with the discussions by sending in your questions to the WhatsApp or by calling in live. Let us move our discussion onto the Treaty of the Hands, the Treaty of Rights with the Hands and the Rights of the Legs. The hand being one of the most integral parts of the human body, we use it to break our fall, we use it to touch, to learn, to write, to draw. We also use it to earn our bread. But have we actually given true justice to our hands? Have we used it for its true purpose? And our hands, would they actually testify against us or for us? A parent will tell you that they dream of seeing their child crawl and then learn to stand, to walk, to run, to get involved with sports, to run on a track field, to run on a football pitch, maybe even run for presidency. One day, inshallah, we will run or walk towards Karbala and meet Aba Abdullah. But would our hands and our legs, would they actually complain to Aba Abdullah for the way that we have used them? Or would they praise us and thank us that they belong to us and thank us for the good deeds that we have done? Let us continue our discussion on the rights of the hand and the rights of the legs with Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. Dr. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa How are you this evening? Alhamdulillah, very well, thank you. Dr. In regards to hands and, and legs in, in the Quran, we have this idea, this narration. People say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hands and he has legs. Examples like um, his hand is upon their hands. Examples of him using his feet to push down hell. From the theology of uh, the school of uh, the, the Ahlul Bayt, can we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is corporeal? And what does he mean when he mentions body parts in regards to himself? It's very interesting that you ask this question concerning uh, the central tenet and belief in the religion of Islam being the belief in the oneness of God, Tawheed, monotheism as it's sometimes translated. And you find that all Muslims, while they believe in one God, do not necessarily have an agreement as to the attributes of God. And especially when it comes to whether God occupies physical space or not, or whether God can be defined with certain body parts which are associated with the creation and which you would not be expecting to be associated with the Creator. In the Shia school, in Shia theology, in the school of the Ahl al-Bayt we're very clear in our belief that when there are verses of the Holy Qur'an that speak about the throne of Allah or the chair of Allah, or as you said, the hands of God, or the shin of God, or there are traditions which some have which say that, for example, God will put his feet into hell to make more room, for example for disbelievers and so on. While we reject such a tradition as an example, when we look at these verses, we see them in the metaphorical, not in the literal. You see, if I now said to the cameraman who's in front of me, that I have the upper hand in this particular competition, does that mean that my hand is up the whole time? No. Upper hand means that I'm in a state of power at this moment. Likewise, when we see the verses in the Holy Quran, which people say, look, there God has hands. You turn around and first you say that this has a metaphorical meaning. Secondly, you find that there is a verse in the Holy Quran that clearly states, Laysa kamithlihi shay. Okay. There is none like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which actually led some people to say, okay, Allah's hands are different to our hands. Our hands, we may, for example, have on our hands, five fingers. Allah may have a thousand fingers. We may have a small hand. Allah may have a huge hand. We again turn around and make it clear that the fact that someone is trying to put Allah 
in a certain body shape, in a certain place, sitting on a chair or on a throne, means that they found a way to define God physically. And that which is able to be defined in a certain space, that then becomes limited. And that which is limited should really not be worshipped. If you are telling me God, for example, sits on a throne, then I'll worship the throne. Because the throne that is able to contain God deserves to be worshipped more than God. Some said, for example, okay, we may not be able to see God now, but we'll be able to definitely see God when? We'll be able to see God on the day of judgment. To the extent that they would say, for example, that God would sit on the throne and the Prophet Muhammad would be next to him. Again, we look at the verse of the Holy Quran when Moses, alayhi salam, the children of Israel said, show us God. And God replies, Len tarani. They will never, ever be able to see me because the len here is litta'bid. In Arabic grammar, it means forever. forever. It's not a matter of at that time they could not see me, but they'll be able to see me later on. No, they will never, ever be able to see me. So in the school of Ahlul Bayt, we are of the belief that when you're talking of, for example, Allah's hands, this is a metaphorical meaning. I think in the last show, when we looked at the rights of hearing and the rights of sight, we said that there are certain ayahs of the Holy Quran, if you just take them literally, then it's unfair to a group of people. What was the one verse we looked at which was unfair to a particular group of people in the Holy Quran, where if you interpret it literally, they have a problem on the Day of Judgment. To do with the blind. The blind. Yeah. The blind in the Holy Quran, you could see very clearly that the verse in the Quran in chapter 17, verse 71, 72, it says those who are blind in this world will be blind in the hereafter. hereafter. Now, a person who's blind in this world is going to say, hold on a minute, guys. What did I do wrong <laughs> to be exactly. blind in the hereafter? Well, we're talking the blindness of the heart. Likewise, when it's coming to the hands, when it's coming to the shins, when it's coming to the eyes, he tells Noah, build your ark under our eyes. Under our eyes doesn't mean Allah is saying, I'm watching you with my eyes, build it. Under our guidance. And under our protection. Yeah? So therefore, when we're looking at this, we're looking in the school of Ahlul Bayt, السلام, there isn't this anthropomorphic belief. I'm not going to deny that certain renowned companions of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt السلام, may at one time or another, in their theological discussions, ask the question and may have even thought of the belief that God, for example, has a body different to our body. But then later on, these beliefs are rescinded. And that the Shi'i creed is clear. If however you go to other schools in Islam, many of the followers of these other schools, if you told them Allah has hands, they'll say no way. If they go and read some of the classical theological works, okay. they'll see that the belief that Allah has hands and Allah has a shin and Allah has a feet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sits on a throne physically is there within their theology. And that's why when people today say that let's discuss and see that the only difference between you know the Shi'i school and other schools is imama, I would go far back as saying there are differences in Tawheed and there are differences even when it comes to infallibility and the question of prophethood. So we don't believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally has hands or literally has a shin, but rather we look at these things metaphorically. Excellent, Sayyid. Just a quick reminder to all the viewers that we are accepting phone calls and if you have a question for the Sayyid, please contact us on 0203 515 0199 or alternatively you can WhatsApp us and inshallah we'll be able to answer your questions. Sayyid, why has Imam Sajjad had this mentioned and tried to discuss the treaty of hands and the treaty of legs? I mean, was, was it necessary? Hands and legs, they don't really have you know, a conscious of themselves. And they There's no really... doubt, you know, the, the hands and the legs are again one of the keys to either performing beautiful moral acts or some of the most detrimental moral acts. And as I said, and I will keep repeating, the aim of Rasalat al huquq is to highlight to you that every body part you've been given is a trust from God. 
so that when you do return back to your Lord, try and ensure that those body parts gave everything they possibly could have back towards the service of their Lord. And so, unlike other declarations of human rights, other treaties of human rights, which will mention, you know, ethics of discussion and dialogue and the rights of people for religion and the rights of people's beliefs, Imam Zain al-Abdin salam focuses on the human body at the beginning of Rasalat al-Hukuq and seeks to remind us that we have a major responsibility with our body as much as with our soul. In our lectures in the mosques on many occasions, you find a lot of the focus is on the spiritual growth. Yes. Many Mawlanas in my job, you'll find that many of them will talk about spiritual growth. And when you're looking at him, you're like, clearly Mawlana has not been to the gym recently. Clearly he's not looking after himself. And it's as if the Ahlul Bayt in the beginning of Rasalat al huquq are trying to remind us that all these body parts that you have, your physical growth is as vital as your spiritual growth. Don't be someone who's got the tasbih in their hand but walks 10 steps and starts breathing or panting heavily. Yeah. And also recognize that these will speak on the Day of Judgment. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Very insightful. In terms of the Qur'an, what, is, what has the Qur'an mentioned in regards to hands and legs? Well, you know, it's, it looks at the hands and the legs in many different instances. But I think one verse in the Holy Qur'an is clearer than any in bringing the combination of the two together. In Surah Yasin, many of us have recited this ayah. يَوْمَ تُكَلِّمُنَا أَيْدِيهِمْ وَتَشْهَدُ أَرْجُلُهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا You find that this verse of the Holy Qur'an tells us that on the Day of Judgment, their hands will speak and their feet will be witnesses as to the acts that they performed. Wow. Here God is telling us that if you think that when you go six feet under the ground, that's all. No, no, no. Everything you did with your hands, I'm going to show on the day of judgment. Everything. And everything that you did with your feet, I'm going to show on the day of judgment. So make sure that when you're living on this earth, which is my rizq to you, don't use this earth to disobey me with the body parts that I've given you. There are people out there in the world who lost their legs due to suicide bombs, yes. due to mines. There are some who had infectious diseases. Don't walk around with these legs that you have, with the feet that you have, without recognizing what a ni'mah, what a blessing you have from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we walk from Najaf to Karbala or others walk, you always will see someone on a wheelchair. Yeah, definitely. And sometimes you may see someone in some countries without their arms. The Quran tells us, يَوْمَ تُكَلِّمُنَا أَيْدِيهِمْ وَتَشْهَدُ أَرْجُلُهُمْ There will be a day where their hands will speak and their feet will testify. I remember a person coming to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Imam Hussein salam, many people only know about 10 days of his life. If you were to ask many people out there, do you know anything about Imam Hussein for the first 56 years of his life? Many don't know. Many know Muharram, Karbala, martyrdom. But Imam Hussein salam, has certain wonderful pearls of wisdom in his life. And one of them I remember when a person came to Imam Hussain and said, That's it, given up, I want to sin. I'm going to sin, no one's going to stop me. Imam Hussain said, Yeah, go ahead, sin. You know, when he comes to him as if he's saying to him, Find me a loophole, I want to sin. <laughs> Imam says, Sin, go ahead, sin. He said, What? He said, Yeah, go ahead, go sin. Now, this person's baffled because he's thinking, Hold on a minute, did Imam Hussain just say to me, Go sin? He said to him, but there are five things to remember. These five conditions. 
If you observe them, go ahead and sin. The person said, what are the five? He said, number one, sin. But sin in a place where Allah cannot see you. Sin. Go ahead. No one's stopping you. But sin in a place where Allah cannot see you. See you. Number two, sin. But don't use Allah's earth to do it. It's not your land. You didn't create it. Yeah. Number three. And it's a number of points which we'll come to, inshallah, because we have the discussion coming on the different levels of sin. Okay. But number three, when you are shown these sins on the Day of Judgment, don't say it's not you. you got to admit. <laughs> and number four as well, angel of death comes to take your soul away. You've got to be ready. Can't be running away from that moment. When Imam Hussain mentions all of these, Imam is trying to highlight to the person that what God's given you, don't use it except for the service of God or the service of the creation of God. Sin in a place where Allah cannot see you. Is there a place that exists where Allah cannot see us? No. Sin, but not on this earth. Sin, but not with God's rizq. Sin, but when the angel of death comes to take away, don't say, I can't go now. You've got to go. Sin, when everything is being shown to you on your cinema screen, are you ready to admit that that is you? Can't deny any of it. Now you can sin. Go ahead. The main point for us, therefore, is that the Quran brought the two together, the hands and the legs. There will be a day where their hands and their feet, our hands and our feet, are going to testify for every act that we did with them. If we've done acts in the service of God, then there's no need to fear the day of judgment. You see, you fear an exam when you haven't revised. But when you've revised for an exam, you can't wait to turn over the paper. Indeed. Likewise, if the day of judgment, if I have prepared for that day, then I'm going to be ready, bring on the questions. If however I've sinned against God with my hands and feet, then that's what I fear. Yep. Excellent, That's very insightful. Say it, the first right, the right of the hand, Imam Sajjad says, the right of the hand is that you stretch it not towards that which is unlawful to you. Now, could this masturbation, which is a big issue in our community, could that fall into this category? And do we have any riwayah or any hadith in regards to this as well? It's very interesting how Islam has laws on certain things which others may find petty. Islam has laws on how you go to the bathroom, how you urinate, how you purify oneself. And that for me highlights the God of Islam is a God who truly wants to guide his creation in every way possible. You see, there are certain religions that can't understand why Islam is so careful with every law. Many religions will just say to you, listen, just be a good human being, that's it. Islam will say, being good a human being, you have to recognize that you have certain desires. You've got to understand which way you direct them towards that which is good and how do you ensure that they're not directed towards that which is harmful okay. for example there are certain desires in islamic ethics we call them neutral desires food if i say to you food is it good or bad neutral it depends what you're eating really <laughs> uh, now now look where, where you're going with that food by itself is neutral Yes. You can direct the act of eating food towards good mm -hmm. or the act of eating food towards harmful. Yeah. I can, for example, with the act of eating food, Islam teaches me that when you slaughter an animal, this is the method of slaughter, the blood gushes out, take, turn it towards the qibla, for example. Don't slaughter that animal in front of other animals and so on and so forth. Likewise, 
food can become harmful. If, for example, there are certain foods that I am told in Islam, these are not good for you, stay away from them. They have a spiritual bad effect on you as well as a physical bad effect yes. on you. You see? Sex mm -hmm. by itself is a neutral desire. You can direct it towards good. Islam on the area of sex is pro-sex more than many religions. As in Christianity encourages that one of the ways to get closer to God is celibacy. Islam is the opposite. Indeed. But Islam also says we will provide you with guidance on which acts sexually are permitted, which acts sexually are not permitted. And how this act of sex is not just a physical union, but is a spiritual union as well. Sex with one's wife, for example. Say husband, wife, no issues. But then sex, adultery, for example, is that which you've directed the neutral desire towards that which is forbidden. Someone else's wife. And so you also have, at the same time, when it comes to certain acts, which are seen as negative on the soul and the development of the human being. Masturbation being an example. Masturbation is completely forbidden in the religion of Islam. Now there may be other religions, there may be others out there who may say, that I'm addicted to masturbation. And I find it difficult to stop. No problem. There's always a way to discuss these things. But you find, for example, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, when he was asked about masturbation, made it clear that this act of masturbation is forbidden within the religion of Islam. And he quoted chapter 23, verse 5 to 6. So if anyone wants to know where in the Quran mm -hmm. it was mentioned about masturbation or the tafsir of a particular ayah was about masturbation, chapter 23, verse 5 to 6, which is the chapter which defines what is a mu'min, for it is called Surat al-Mu'minun. Yep, the chapter is known as the so, chapter of the believers. Yep. Excellent. Sayyidina, in terms of stretch it not towards which is unlawful to you, we see in our community a lot of the times people stretching towards, you one know, one. stretching towards like something which, you know, is, for example, cheating the government, uh, taking, um, you know, benefits from the government while working cash in hand. Is this also, does this classify, does this come under stretching towards that which is unlawful to you? I'm amazed sometimes when the most religious families and members of the Muslim community are the ones who are stealing from the government. I'm amazed how there are people who actually see themselves as religious and they will steal or they will scam the benefits or the welfare checks. They are the type of people who will discuss religion with you from now until the day of judgment. But they will scam the welfare, blatantly. They'll scam the welfare of the country. What's their excuse? Their excuse is that we are taking from the kuffar. We're taking from the Disbelievers. disbelievers that rightly belongs to us and therefore when I take money or I take a welfare check with my hands or a benefits check and I've scammed it it's not scamming I'm stealing from disbelievers okay Habibi why are you then living in the country of disbelievers go live in Pakistan go live in Iran go live in Saudi Arabia go live there why over here are you using these hands to steal? I'm ashamed. Honestly, I'm ashamed. When sometimes the newspapers publish reports about the demographic of the ones who steal from the benefits, you know, this DSS and, and welfare okay. checks and scams and castle. You look at the names of the people. I'm telling you, you think you're looking at a list of the prophets and companions. Mashallah. Believe you me. When you see names such as Muhammad and Osman and Zubair and Ja'far and God knows who. You're looking at these names, you're like, what's going on here? Are we talking about a mosque wedding invite? 
Or are we talking about people scamming these systems? Those same people will cry for Imam al Hussein in Muharram. Yeah. Those same people stand in the front rows of prayer in, Ramadan, in Shah Ramadan. And the Quran has already said to them, Yawma tukallimuna aidi wa tashhadu arjuluhum. Your feet, which you use to walk to pick up that government check, or those hands that signed off saying, I don't have any other job. Yes. The guy himself has six businesses on the side. And he's sitting there comfortably claiming benefits. It's an embarrassment. But you know the beautiful thing about the Quran? The Quran always makes it clear to you, you're going to get away with a lot here. All of us, we're going to get away with a lot. Inland revenue, government, people will find their loopholes, their ways to get away. On the day of judgment, you will be accountable. That when you came to live in this country, and this country allowed you to use hospitals, schools, and then someone says, but you know, uh, this money I'm claiming back from the disbelievers, yes, but you're also using the welfare system of the country. You go there at 4 a.m. In the, in, the, in the night to that hospital. You've got a doctor who's sitting there waiting for you to treat you. You've got a country which is saying to you that you're able to practice the religion here. Therefore, when someone asks that today Muslims are, are stealing from the, from the country, but saying that this is because the people have stolen our money or our wealth, it's not acceptable. The hands on the Day of Judgment will speak about every penny that was taken in a wrong way. I remember there is a, a story they narrate. It's attributed to Imam Ali السلام, and his brother Aqil. And without going into, you know, discussions concerning authenticity, there is a moral to be taken from the story where Aqil is in a bit of financial difficulty. Imam Ali السلام, is the caliph of the Islamic State. The treasury is in his hands. And it's so easy for a person in such a position to use their hands, to take a bit of money on the side, put it in their brother's pocket. What better thing can you do when you're in power then employ your brothers, your son-in-laws, your grandchildren. Nepotism. No better way to scam in religion than by ensuring that all of your family members are put into positions where you could take a certain amount of money of donors and say, well, my grandson here works for me, so he's the one who will be on this check, for example. They say Uthman bin Affan's downfall, the third caliph, was that he had Marwan ibn al-Hakam back, yes. and he had Walid bin Uqba back, Samara bin Jundub, and the hand was saying, look after him, look after him, look after him, look after him. And Imam Ali alayhi salam, you know, I was asked a question recently, why Imam Ali alayhi salam, you know, in his four years, there were so many political problems. Is it because Imam Ali politically is not as great as those who came before him or those who came after him? I say, number one, show me all the Khalifas of Islam. Any of them who've written a letter like Imam Ali's to Malik al-Ashtar for in Nahj al-Balagha. Number two, Imam Ali alayhi salam says, if it wasn't for taqwa, I would have been the most cunning politician. But he has that consciousness of Allah's presence. And where does he show it? When his hand could have easily taken. Because when you're in a religious position, your hand can easily take here. You're my son, you should have this position. You're my grandson, you should have this position. Muslim world is full of nepotism. The Muslim world is full of? Nepotism. Where people are put in positions 
not because they're worthy of that position, but because they're the son of so-and-so, or they're the grandson of so-and-so, or they're the nephew of so-and-so, not because they're worthy. There are many out there who are more worthy than them. Many. But they're put into that position because what can you do? You get away with the odd non-profit over here. I'll employ him. He's employ I'll employ him. He doesn't have a job. I'll employ him. Before you know it, all the money of the donors is going to this guy's cousin, his nephew, and his grandson. Yeah. Those hands... The Quran says, Imam Zayn al said what? The right of your hand is you don't stretch it towards that, to that which is unlawful. Unlawful. Do you know how people justify it? Not in the way Imam Ali justified it. Imam Ali did not say, Hila Sharia is a legal <laughs> loophole. Put my son, put my grandson, put my cousin. Go to many Islamic organizations in the world today. And you'll find 10 family members sit on the board or on the trustees. And you'll never get rid of them. Because if you reproduce properly, you can keep bringing more and more kids into the world. Now, Imam Ali salam, instead of stretching his hand when his brother says, listen, I need some dough, I need some money. I beg you, now you're in power. Give me something. Put something in my pocket. Our mosques. Everyone's employed family. Imam Ali السلام, could easily say, you know what? Uh, let me look around. Where can I put this son of mine, this brother of mine, Aqil? Let me, you know, let me just put him in any position. We'll sign off that he's, you know, doing work and we'll look after him. Any position. We can scam something, can't we? Indeed. No. He at that moment says, you want money from the treasury? Give me your hand. He puts it near what? The fire. The fire. Aqil moves his hand. Imam says, what's wrong? He said, the fire is going to burn my hand. He said, you're worried about this fire? How about the fire of the day of judgment? Isn't that true? Definitely. You're telling me, come scam this. Give me a job. I'm your nephew. I'm your grandson. Wallah, there are people out there who are a million times better than a lot of the nepotism we have in the Muslim world. But they don't have the luck. Wrong surname. Honestly. And so therefore, Imam Ali السلام, could have easily scammed well, come and visit him. One wanted to be governor of Basra, other wanted to be governor of Kufa. Look at the justice of Imam Ali السلام. A candle is in front of them. They come to him, they say, listen, we have a, a private issue we need to see you about. What does he do? <sighs> Puts another candle. They're like, why did you just do that? He said that first candle was to be used for the affairs of the Muslim Ummah. You've come to see me over your personal, personal issue. Issues. I should put a candle I bought with my own money. Subhanallah. That justice of Imam Ali alayhi salam was unique. And that justice is missing. Quran makes it clear in chapter 4 verse 135 O oh mankind be maintainers of justice witnessing only to Allah even if it means it's going to be against yourself or your near ones the biggest scams that occur in the Muslim world is when the hands take money to give to the near ones to give them a job so that their laziness in the world continues. Thank you very much, Sayyid. Very insightful. We are going to go to a break now. And just a reminder to all the viewers 
that we are taking calls in on 0203 515 or alternatively, you can send your questions onto the number uh, on below on WhatsApp. Also, a quick mention that on Tuesday, inshallah, we'll be having a special program to commemorate the great personality, Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, with special guest, Hayda Jizani, inshallah, that'll be on Tuesday. Join us, uh, join us again after the break, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome back to Live in London where we were discussing the rights of the hands and the rights of the legs. So now we were discussing uh, issues in our community uh, in regards to stretch towards which is unlawful to you. We were discussing about scamming the government and um, do we also have, well we do, we do have it because I've seen it myself. We have people who steal from banks to fraudulent behaviour, uh, theft in terms of trading where they'll sell you something uh, misleading you and trying to tell you something that's not what it actually is. Um, do these also come un under the category of reaching towards that which is unlawful to you? There is a, a whole surah about those who are defrauders, who are who lie about quantities that they're giving. You know, there was a period where people were scamming uh, a big scam called the VAT scam. Okay. They knew very well what they were doing. They knew very well when they were, for example, reporting certain costs, deleting certain costs, charging on certain areas. And the Muslims have this very clever habit where when they do a business transaction in haram, they love to give charity straight away as if that's absolved them. So now if I steal a certain amount of money um, or I've scammed a VAT scam or I've, you know, messed about with some fraud, uh, is there any mosque I can donate to? <laughs> because what you do is that you make what you've done become something less haram because I gave it away as charity or gave half of it to build a mosque or I sponsored a majlis after I stole from the government or stole from innocent people. You've read the, the surah in the Quran, Waylun lil mutaffafeen, surah 83 of the Holy Quran. That surah talks about people who, for example, you come to buy a kilogram of, let's say, oranges, a box of oranges from somebody. What that person's done is when he's weighed the oranges, he makes you think you really got, you know, that weight. Mm -hmm. Put a lot of paper in. You see how some yeah. people do it. You add paper in the box, you add this, you add that. And then you'll think it to yourself, you get home and you're like, I've taken half of this out. There's all, it's half of it's paper. Surah 83 of the Holy Quran begun Wailun lil mutaffafeen Woe be to the defrauders Wail is either Woe be to the defrauder Or there is a certain place in hell For the defrauders For those who backbite and slander Wailun li kulli humazat al For example Also begins with Wail So you find That if someone out there is committing fraud they try and look after that fraud or that haram that they've earned either by giving a lot of charity away or by doing an even cleverer thing go to hajj that year because they've heard hadiths from people like me on in lectures that we narrate from the holy prophet peace be upon him and his family and we narrate from others that if you go to hajj it's all cool clean slate let's get on with life no it doesn't work like that and for the lover of Ahlul Bayt when you see the way the rights of Ahlul Bayt were usurped, the wealth of Ahlul Bayt was usurped to the extent that Imam Ali السلام, says in Nahj al balagha all that me and Fatima had was fedak and even that they took from us. I can't sit there in majalis, talk about for example fedak and other areas and say, you know this person fedak, they took Fatima Zahra's right, and I'm the one also taking Fatima Zahra alayhi salam's right by not paying my khums. Why am I not paying? The classic answer, oh, I don't know where it's going. I don't know if it's being... No, no, no. The human <laughs> hates giving money away. The human, you tell him, take. 
they'll say. You tell them, give, they'll make a million excuses why not to give. <laughs> so, those out there who are involved in this fraud or, this, or these scams or using credit cards to buy expensive things and saying, somehow justifying it by doing something religious later, it's all nonsense. It really is. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's door of mercy, door of repentance is always open. That hand which has touched haram, that hand which has acted with haram, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never closes the door for coming back towards his path. And that's why the constant repetition, when we have people now coming to who have done all these scams, the constant repetition of Astaghfirullah, Rabbi wa atubu alayhi. Not only do you ask Allah for forgiveness, but now you say, now I'm returning back. Awab is one who returns. When I do istighfar, my intention should be that I'm looking to return back to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, I'm just doing astaghfirullah, Rabbi wa atubu alayhi. I've done a couple of scams. Um, you know, I put a couple of houses under his name and her name and his name and his name and scam the government. And then I'm doing istighfar. No, there has to be regret and a willingness to never perform such an act again. Yeah. And uh, is this the, the best way to reform our community and then move them away from uh, such acts of, of fraudulent behavior and stealing, you could say? Believe you me, I will never forget a tradition. Imam al-Sadiq had a companion who he had asked, listen, go to Egypt and try and make us some money. Try and make us some money. Someone wants to make some money. Person came back, he made 100% profit. Wow. Monopolized the market and it hurt Imam al Sadiq. The Imam al Sadiq said to him, I said to you, go make us some money. I didn't say put the people in a dilemma and problems. Oh. Try and share, try and recognize that people are of different levels. And so the Ahlul Bayt didn't want this philosophy that I'm going to destroy my opponents and anyone in my way, I'll find every which way possible to destroy them and make sure that they don't have no business competition with me. And you know what, I'm gonna, and, and, you know, because the human being, really that film, Wolf, 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 of, Wall Street. Wolf of Wall Street. Not that I'm necessarily recommending the film because people might, <laughs> it's, it's might go online not and, appropriate. Say, <laughs> and say, you know, said Amman Akshwani recommended this, that. But the title is intriguing. That a person in that world if they stretch their hand, and the Quran mentions that, listen, don't put your hand too far forward, nor be too stingy. Because God save us from the other side, the stingy guys. So one side are those who want to chase every wealth possible. The other side are the stingy.com. <laughs> the ones who their hands in their pocket like this, every single time you go out with them, for example, when the bill comes, I forgot my wallet. I forgot my wallet. I forgot my wallet. <laughs> I need to go to I the bathroom. I forgot my wallet. I forgot my wallet. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, your hands, don't stretch it too far to do something haram. Nor tighten your hand, tighten your fist as they say. It's so tight. What's the phrase? When someone is so stingy, he's tight fisted. Mm -hmm. So... That's fundamental for us to reflect upon. Yeah. Sayyidna, moving on from stealing, the famous Quranic ayah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَالسَّارِقُ وَالسَّارِقَ فَاقْتَعُوا أَيْدِيَهُمَا جَزَاعٌ بِمَا كَسَابَ نَكَالًا مِنَ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ غَيْزِ خَيْ Sorry, عَزِيزٌ حقيم. It's referring to cutting the hand mm. when stealing. I mean, one second, we've got a caller on the line. Inshallah, we'll be able to uh, contact this caller and get through to them. Assalamu alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? Assalamu alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Technical team, can you call the caller back, please? Okay, they're trying to get a hold of him again. Assalamu alaikum, your name and where are you calling well, from? Alaykum, there we go. Uh, yep. My name is Ali and I'm calling from London. Your question towards the Sayyid, please. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyidna. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Sayyidna, in the Quran, it's mentioned that Allah has a hand. 
and um, the Sunni narrative is that Allah has a physical hand, whereas I've heard Shia say that the hand of Allah is um, figures such as Imam Ali alayhi salam. How do we um, explain this and how do we um, justify this explanation? Thank you very much for your question. Sure, I think we said earlier in the show that when we say Allah has hand, it means Allah's authority. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran transfers his authority, his wilaya. If you look in chapter 5, verse 55, God says, Innama waliyukum Allahu wa rasuluh. So sometimes you have Allah's authority, Allah waliyu alladheena amanu, yukhrijuhum min al-dhulumat al nur Sometimes he'll transfer some of that authority to his messenger. Hence he says, Innama waliyukum Allahu wa rasuluh. Sometimes there's an extension from the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, to the representative of them. إِنَّمَا وَلِيُكُمْ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ If Islam ended there, then why? وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيَتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَهُمْ رَاكَعُونَ وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولَهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَإِنَّ حَزْبَ اللَّهُمْ الْغَالِبُونَ Surely your authority is Allah, the Prophet, those who believe. If Islam is complete with Allah and His Prophet, why, Ya Allah, are you telling us that your wilaya has even extended to those who believe? And you tell us that those who take Allah and the Prophet and those who believe as their guardians, they are the party of Allah. Therefore, when we say that Imam Ali is Yad Allah, we say that that means he is one of those who supports the message of Allah and ensures that the authority of Allah is protected on the earth. Excellent. Thank you, Sayyid. Back to the Quranic ayah in regards to stealing. Uh, if I could translate in English. And as for the man who steals, and as for the woman who steals, cut off their hands as a punishment for what they have earned. An exemplary punishment from Allah. And Allah is the mighty and the wise. A lot of people use this ayah against Muslims as an attack that they're very, very uh, extreme. They're very, very uh, barbaric. Can this I actually be implemented here in London as a Muslim myself? If someone was to steal no, something no, no, from no. me, no, no, you're not. That's what someone steals from you in London. You don't get a you don't get a <laughs> knife and go and chop their their hands off. This these verses, of course, are not only for the Quran, the Bible, the Torah, or the Old Testament. You'll find that the punishments that we see in Islam are also pre-Islamic punishments that can be seen amongst the children of Israel. And I don't blame non-Muslims when they're like, so you guys will chop off the hand of a thief? But what many non-Muslims don't know is, it takes a lot for that act to ever happen. Okay. It's not like it's so easy that, okay, this guy stole, that's it, get a knife and chop their hands off. Not at all. For example, in my own studies, and others may have studied more than me who will be able to provide even more, I found 19 conditions in Islamic law that all have to be fulfilled. 19 conditions. 19. MashaAllah. And even if all 19 are fulfilled, there is still the possibility of forgiveness or giving that person a chance. Extraordinary. So for example, if you have, there is a period of famine in a Muslim country and someone steals. Can you cut their hands off? No way. The government is to be blamed. Why are you not looking after the people? If there's a period of poverty, if the person doesn't know the, the punishment for stealing, if the person steals while they are compelled, for example, because of a state of hunger. Yes. So, and there's other, other punishments as well. Other, other conditions, sorry. So, this idea that, oh, in Islam, if you steal, automatically someone's hands are to be, no. And I would also say that in this day and age, for you to actually implement the true laws of Allah, I think there needs to be even a reform on that area. Yeah. Excellent. Say that we have a call a long way from Africa, inshallah, we'll be able to get through. Assalamu alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? I'm from DRC, Mr. Murtaza. Assalamu alaikum. Your question, please, for the Sayyid. Sorry? Your question for the Sayyid. Your question, please. I think we've lost them. 
Inshallah, technical team, if you can get a hold of the brother again, please, and we we're very intrigued to hear his uh, answer or his question. Sayyidina, um, in regards to having, you were saying that, you know, for, for there to be these punishments, the 19 conditions, and you were referring to also uh, having an Islamic government. Um, what are the actual conditions or ways we can form an Islamic government uh, for these actual punishments to be uh, upheld? And what about the examples we have today of Republic of Pakistan, Islamic Republic of Pakistan, Islamic Republic of Iran, Saudi Arabia? Well, all of them, if they, if they all believe that they're Islamic states, then it's up to the people of the country whether they want Islam to be implemented in the country or not. But even then, if you're going to go to these countries and find the statistics when it comes to, for example, cutting the hands of the thief, it's not something you're going to find in, in thousands or in millions at all. Saudi Arabia is probably the only country I've seen where the Rolex store is completely left open with nobody in there when it's prayer time and not one watch is stolen. Now that deterrent of knowing someone's going to take your hands makes a lot of people think twice. But I do believe that even if someone does steal something in these countries, the first direction or the decision should not be cutting their hands, but rather should be a reform of the person, trying to help them grow, help them develop. Every human being deserves a chance. Yeah. So we have a call on the line. Hopefully we we'll get sure. through to this, uh, the brother again. Salaamu Alaikum. Your question, please, for the Sayyid. Yeah. Waalaikumsalam. My question is that all businessmen, as, as well as me too, using the invoices of uh, importing invoices, if... My question is, we are using the under invoices business, you mean what I mean, uh, to save the duty. If we put full invoices, we have to pay more duty and then we can't do the business. I understand, you understand? So what is the solution for that? Thank you very much. Solution for that <laughs> is to make sure you have a good accountant. MashaAllah, <laughs> um, one, yeah? Yeah, make sure you have a good accountant, a solid accountant. Uh, who's able to provide you with an understanding of the laws of the government. You know, the government... Yes try their hardest to tell us that, you know what, there are ways of forming companies where they'll try and limit the taxes that um, will be upon you. There are ways in which you can also claim back and so on. So refer back to your accountant. But no, don't be in that situation where, you know what, unless I scam, I'm not going to make money. There's only one razzaq and that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Excellent. Sayyid, the punishment for theft if all the 19 conditions are fulfilled under an Islamic state, is to cut the hand. Mm. What qualifies as the hand, well, according to the Ahlul Bayt and, and for yourself as a fiqh, fiqh student, what is, what is the hand? What, what does it um, Some schools as? of Islam said that when the Quran said, for example, you cut the hand, some said from here, from the shoulder. shoulder. Area. Others said no, from the elbow. Others said no, from the wrist. School of Ahl al-Bayt said, only the fingers. Why? Because in prostration and sujood, there are seven areas that must be in sujood. Correct. The forehead. Forehead, we, and the Maliki school of fiqh. Both say it is more recommended to prostrate on earth. Yes. Us and the Maliki. Maliki, our brothers in Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, and so on. They both of our schools of fiqh say it is more recommended to prostrate on earth. And that's why I'm sad when I see on these internet websites people, many of these, who, who don't know their own school's jurisprudence, We'll say these Shia pray on a stone and our mushrik. Maliki school as well recommends that a person prays on the earth. I mean, they also pray with their hands open. With their hands it? open as well. Malik being a student of Imam al-Sadiq as well. Alayhi salam. If I cut the hand of the person, there's a wajib area in sujood which is the palms. Yes. That person won't be able to perform their sujood properly again. This was interestingly discussed in the time of Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam. Imam al-Jawad, when asked by the Abbasid Khalifa, where do we cut the hands of this thief from? 
Quran says the male thief, female thief, you cut their hands. But from where? The Imam quoted the ayah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ The places of sujood are for Allah. You cut off here, you take away the chance of the person's sujood. You cut these, person can still go down. Subhan Rabbi al-A'la wa bihamda. Yeah. Excellent. Zayna, on the topic of hands, and on the topic we were discussing of the hands that will testify, when we think of hands testifying in praise of people, we think of Jafar al-Tayyar, we think of Abbas ibn Ali alayhi salam. Could you explain a little on how they donated and gave their hands in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Absolutely right. You know, selflessly, altruism is embodied by Abbas, son of Ali, and Ja'far al-Tayyar, his uncle. And that's why I'm not surprised when Imam Zayn al-Abidin alayhi salam brings the two of them together in the famous hadith. رحم الله عمي العباس فلقد آثر وفدى وواسى أخاه بنفسه فأعطاه الله جناحين عوض يديه كما صنع لعمه جعفر بن أبي طالب الله has placed mercy on my uncle عباس عليه السلام for he altruistically selflessly sacrificed with his self for his brother so Allah gave him wings in place of the arms that he lost like he did with his uncle Ja'far, son of Abu Talib. Because we know Ja'far al-Tayyar. Yes. Why we call him Ja'far al-Tayyar? Ja'far, the one who flies with wings in Jannah. It's, maj it's majestic, metaphorical yes. to say that when he lost his two hands in the battle of Mu'tah, when he lost them, in honor of that, Rasulullah told his wife, Asma bint Umayyis, Allah has replaced his hands with wings in Jannah. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas salam, we know very well, lost his right arm on the plains of Karbala and mentions the famous line, Wallahi anqata'tumu yameeni, inni uhami abadan an dini wa an imam sadiq al-yaqini najla al-nabi al-tahir al amini when they cut off his left arm, Ya nafs la takhshay min al-kuffar, wa abshiri bi rahmat al-jabbar, ma'a al-nabi al-sayyid al-mukhtar, qad qata'u bi baghihim yasari. So what you find here is that Abu al-Fadh loses his arms but is still talking. Most people would cry, most would die. <laughs> yeah, but sure. with Abu al-Fadh, nobody showed altruism and sacrifice like Abbas bin Ali alayhi salam. And truly, if a person wants to ensure that يَوْمَ تُكَلِّمُنَا أَيْدِيهِمْ Our hands will speak, then you want to make sure that your hands, for example, have served food to the creation of Allah at Majlis al Hussein, have helped serve food to break someone's fast. In some cases, I've even remembered the chest of Imam al Hussein. When we do Matem, we are remembering. When people tell us, why do you Shia beat your chest? We're remembering the horses that trampled on the chest of the grandson of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Say another caller on the line yeah. Salaamu Alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? Uh, Wa Alaikum Salaam, uh, my name is Adnan, I'm calling from Zurich Okay, your uh, question for the Sayyid please uh, My question is about homes and okay. uh, uh, for example the money that we put aside for ziyarat for example or for travel is that uh, pre-homes or should we pay homes on it and then for from the leftover money do perform the arats for example thank you very much for your question inshallah we have our discussion coming up on homes okay in a couple of shows time my dear brother we're going to be discussing all of the laws related to homes and the different opinions of the maraja in relation to the issues of homes inshallah inshallah so stay tuned inshallah brother and we'll be answering your question in the following discussions, insha'Allah. Sayyidina, we were talk, you were talking about the mustahabat uh, of, of the hands. Uh, I mean, you were talking about doing matam, remembering about Abdullah. You were talking about giving, um, um, you know, tabarruk uh, and, and um, giving, uh, you know, other forms of abadat, um, you could say. Is there anything that you actually recommend to the brothers that, you know what, I think that this should be incorporated in, in the community and they should be doing this a lot more in regards to their hands? 
on my eyes. I think the, the cupping of the hands in supplication is the most wonderful act. And I think that should be incorporated more within our communities. Yeah. Thank you, Seth. The right of the legs. Yeah. Imam, Imam Mr. Jad says that the right of the leg is that you walk not with them towards which is unlawful to you. Could you explain a little bit more on this? What is unlawful to walk towards? As in, are we not allowed to walk into certain places? No, I think it's quite obvious that you know, there are certain places wherever sin is committed in the sense that it's going to lead us to committing sins, we should try and stay away from it. And what have the Ahlul Bayt said in regards to uh, walking towards the good and walking towards the bad? Well, I think there's numerous traditions from the Ahlul Bayt السلام, where they're discussing the walking to the mosque, for example. Mm -hmm. Walking to earn a living, there are 70 levels of worship and the highest of them is to earn a lawful living. If you're looking within the Holy Quran, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks of the different types of walking. Okay. It's amazing that there is even the etiquettes and the ethics of walking in Islam. Moses's interaction with the daughters of Prophet Shu'aib السلام, in chapter 28 of the Holy Quran. The daughter of Shu'aib walks with a shyness. Istihya. You know, if, 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 if the Iraqis see a girl who doesn't have any shyness, she'll, they'll say, Metistihi. And if there is a girl with shyness, they'll say, Tistihi. And the Quran mentions Istihya in relation to the daughter of Shu'aib when she's interacting with Moses. The Quran mentions that one of the etiquettes of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, was to walk in the markets of Arabia, in the streets of Arabia, like everybody else in the society. Luqman brings up a son who seemingly is troubled with his beliefs about God. There's a whole chapter, chapter 31 of the Holy Quran. And that chapter, chapter 31, is Luqman's interaction with his son. You know, he begins, Ya la tushrik billah in the shirk azim. Then later he begins to talk about, you know, his parents. Then he begins to talk with him about sin, how each sin will be exposed and revealed on the Day of Judgment. Then he talks with him about his etiquettes of walking and etiquettes of speech. There is this mentioning of وَغْضَضْ مِنْ صَوْتِكْ وَقْصِدْ بِمَشِيكْ There is a mentioning that when you walk, walk with... It's interesting that the word is related to what we normally use for, for justice, equity. Walk equitably on the earth. When you walk... These legs that God's given you is not so that you trample on the rights of others. But rather, you think of walking on the earth and respecting both the poor who are walking next to you and recognizing those who may have more than you. Some of us may walk on the earth and may see an animal and may stamp on it. That's not walking justly. And the Quran mentions... Those who walk on the earth, maraha. Those who work on the earth, honan. You know, there are those who walk on the earth very arrogantly. Qarun, for example, would walk on the earth arrogantly. There are those, no, who walk on the earth humbly. Someone comes to say, salamu alaykum to them. They embrace them. How are you? You know, um, if there is an old lady crossing the road, they'll make an effort to help her. So the Quran seeks to provide us with an understanding that your legs that you've been given, use them to set an example of equity and justice and humility when you're walking on the earth. Yeah. Sena, do we have any hadith from the Ahlul Bayt in terms of the etiquettes of walking 
Um, I know going to university and college, certain people were known to walk with a certain style or a certain methodology. In the school of Ahlul Bayt, how should one be walking? Well, we've all had a bop in our time, you know, each. <laughs> Definitely, we still have. You know, some of us still have, you know, and there might be the odd shoulder movement as you're walking and so on. And I, I think that, like I said, it's the Quran that sets us with the principles. And the Quran wants us to have that, you know, God mentions after every verse about walking yes. that he doesn't like the arrogant you know he likes mm -hmm. those who walk on the earth softly those who walk on the earth humbly and while sometimes we may forget that is what jihad in nafs is and why is the quran sometimes called a dhikr mm -hmm. you know the quran has a number of names quran furqan kitab dhikr Dhikr in the sense of a reminder that when I'm about when I'm walking on the earth and I've got this sense of arrogance at that moment I remember the ayahs where Allah says I don't like those who are arrogant so walk on the earth humbly for the true servants of Allah walk on the earth humbly and you look at the Ahlul Bayt salam, something extraordinary about them how many of them went to Hajj by foot oh, yes. and would insist when people would beg them come sit on the camel Come sit on the horse. They says, no, I'll walk. Could easily have turned around and said, listen, there's a horse there, there's a camel there. But no. Imam al-Hasan salam they narrate, went to Hajj by foot 20 times. Wow. Why? Because every step that I take is going to speak on the day of judgment, my feet. So I might as well make sure that I've accumulated enough steps towards going to the house of Allah oh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or one of the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inspiring. And in terms of dhikr and reminding, I'd like to remind the viewers that we are taking in phone calls and uh, questions if you have, you want to direct to the Sayyid, please contact us on 0203 515 or alternatively on the WhatsApp number provided and inshallah we'll be able to answer your question. Sayyid, you were talking about walking towards Allah's house and one of the most famous walks that we know in the Shia community is walking to Karbala from Najaf to Karbala. Many say that this is just uh, entertainment, it's a, it's a carnival, um, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a celebration. Um, how do we reply to these people to let them know it's, it's much more than that? I think, I think walking was already established as an honourable act which became an obligatory act, the walk of Hajar from Safa to Marwa, Marwa yes. where now all of us cannot complete our Hajj unless we walk from Safa to Marwa. God recognized and made clear for us that her walk from Safa to Marwa is to be honored by everybody. So some people decide that when they want to go towards Karbala, they see traditions from Imam al-Sadiq where he asks Allah to have mercy on those who go for Ziyarat al Hussein and who suffer in going to Ziyarat al Hussein. فَرْحَمْ تِلْكَ الْخُدُودَ الَّتِي تَقَلَّبُ عَلَىٰ قَبْرِ أَبِي عَبْدِ اللَّهِ الَّتِي تَقَلَّبَتْ عَلَىٰ قَبْرِ أَبِي عَبْدِ اللَّهِ Oh Allah have mercy on those cheeks that rub themselves on the grave of Imam al-Hussein. وَرْحَمْ تِلْكَ لَعْيُنَ الَّتِي جَرَدْ دُمُوعَهَا لَنَا Have mercy on those eyes that shed their tears for us. وَرْحَمْ تِلْكَ الْوُجُوهِ الَّتِي غَيَّرَتْهَا الشَّمْسِ Have mercy on those faces that the sun, the heat has burned. وَرْحَمْ تِلْكَ الْقُلُوبِ الَّتِي احْتَرَقَتْ لَنَا Have mercy on the hearts that burn for us. وَرْحَمْ تِلْكَ الصَّرْخَةَ الَّتِي كَانَتْ لَنَا Have mercy on those who scream when they're coming towards the grave of Aba Abdullah al-Hussein alayhi salam اللهم إني أستودعك تلك الأنفس وتلك الأبدان حتى ترويهم من الحوض يوم العطش Oh Allah, these people who have come for Ziyarat al-Hussein I'm leaving them in your hands Quench their thirst Meaning that when they come on the day of judgment let them be quenched with the pool of Kothar. You have the authority to decide who is. Is it obligatory that I walk to Karbala? No. 
person decides to land in Baghdad and wants to take a form of transport, no problem. It's not obligatory. Saddam Hussein, when he was leading Iraq in his different positions of authority from the late 70s until the early 2000s, had made it clear that the public display of mourning for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam in that walk was banned. And so sometimes I think that those who are trying to take certain swipes at the at those zawar of Imam al Hussein who are walking, I don't think they've tasted those of us who lost family members oh, yeah. trying to preserve the mourning rituals in a very difficult time in Iraq. But at the end of the day, you know, as I said, you go to Karbala not because you want to experience a walk. Yes. When people say to me, you know what, if I'm not walking, then I'm not going. No, no, you go to the grave of Imam Hussain because that gets you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can walk, you walk. You can't walk, you can't walk. But some people say, because the Quran says, my feet are going to be a witness to my acts, I might as well say, <laughs> That my feet undertook the visit of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. Yeah. Very touching, Sayyid. I've got a question that's been sent in here and it's saying, Salam Sayyid, great show as, as usual. Um, how do we stop and monitor our youth who like to explore our cities? And how do we stop them from walking down sinful streets or sinful establishments? Thank you, regards. It's not easy as in, you know, someone goes to Amsterdam on holiday, they're not going because they want to go and see a church. You know, there's a red light <laughs> district there and people are obviously going to go and walk in these areas. But you can only remind, the Quran says something beautiful about the Holy Prophet. You know, Tanzil al-Aziz al-Rahim litunthira qawman. He warns a group of people. You can warn someone, you can tell them about the pitfalls of going to certain streets that eventually you're going to be led towards certain places. But then, you know, after that, Yeah. Sayyidina, the story of Hur um, is very, very relevant to our discussion because Hur may have done many, many wrong actions with his hands and walked God knows how much against Imam Hussein. But the final stage is he, t he turned around, he, he changed it around. Can we use his story and his example for the viewers today who are thinking that I have done so much bad with my hands, I've walked to so many terrible places. Is there any hope for them? Yeah, I think it's a, a poignant question because, you know, his walking from, you know, Kufa to Karbala, the original aim of it is to, you know, make Imam al-Hussein pledge allegiance to Yazid. And at that stage, he really was placing himself in a position of hellfire because he blocks the water from the children of Imam al-Hussein who are the grandchildren of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. But it's wonderful how maybe 15, 20 steps later, he tells his son Bukhair and his servant that let's go towards the side of the grandson of Rasulullah. Those 15, 20 steps are a metaphor for all of us in life. It's on a Friday night, on a Saturday night, you can be on your way to disobeying Allah. But you can also use those feet to turn around and go to a place which is going to help you obey Allah. And you look at his wonderful lines on the 10th of Muharram. A man who the night before is not offering water to the family of Imam Hussein. On the 10th of Muharram, إِنِّي أَنَا الْحُرْ وَمَأْوَى الضَّيْفِ أَضْرِبُكُمْ فِي أَعْنَاقِكُمْ بِالسَّيْفِ عَنْ خَيْرِ مَنْ حَلَّ بِلَادِ الْخَيْفِ أَضْرِبُكُمْ وَلَا أَرَى مَنْ خَيْفِ yeah, the, the, the confidence of those steps towards Allah. That wonderful line of Nabi Ibrahim, إِنِّي ذَاهِبٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّي سَيَهْدِي I am walking towards my Lord. He'll guide me. رَبِّي هَبْلِي مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ And so on. So you've got Hur bin Yazid al riyahi and that's why I'm not surprised in those wonderful lines of Imam Zain al-Abideen about Hur. لَنِعْمَ الْحُرْ حُرُّ بَنِي رِيَاحِ صَبُورٌ عِنْدَ مُشْتَبَكِ الرِّمَاحِ 
لنعم الحر اتفادى حسينا وجاد بنفسه عند الصباح you go to Imam Zain al-Abani alayhi salam praising the change of hur. One minute, the footsteps are going towards hell. The next minute, he's using his feet to heaven. It truly was the feet that took the highway to heaven. I think that's a lesson for all of us. That we may have used our feet to go to places where we've disobeyed Allah. We can also use the same feet to go towards the places where you can obey God as well. Yep. Very touching, Said. Very touching. A final thought to any of the viewers in regards to this discussion, something you want them to take away with them. I think, you know, we're, we're looking at the, you know, the body parts. And I think if a person constantly reflects before they're about to perform an act, if they reflect that, what will my body parts say on the day of judgment about the way I just used it at this moment? I think many things will change in one's spirituality as well. A final question from, uh, <laughs> I have to ask you this question. Salah said, what is the relevance of singing You Never Walk Alone Before Every Liverpool Game? The relevance of singing it, well, you know, it's, it's the anthem of the most famous and the greatest football club <laughs> in the world. Um, and it teaches us a lesson that, you know what, the rights of your, of your, of your <laughs> legs is that you ensure that they are firmly walking towards Anfield. the Anfield Road or the Cop. Goodison Park, inshallah. No, never. Just, <laughs> just to park the car and walk across Stanley Park. Thank you very much, Sayyid, Thank you uh, for tonight's discussion. And My pleasure. Allah. Thank you so much. Just a quick reminder to all the viewers that we will be having a special program on Tuesday with uh, Dr. Sayyid Aman Nakshwani in regards to the Waladat of Sayyid Zainab. And we'll be having a special guest, Sayyid Jizani, inshallah, will be joining us and blessing us with his voice. Inshallah, we'll see you then on Tuesday. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.